This video is all about the very basics of compression and ambient music. When to use it, when not to use it, how to use it, and stick around to the end for a couple of advanced techniques that you can use once you've gotten the hang of it. Hey, it's Marcus from Holosuite. I spent years confused by compression, and to be honest, there are still a lot of settings in a compressor that I haven't even tried. When I started making experimental music, the only guides on compression that I could find were for electronic or rock music, and I couldn't understand how that applied to me because I wasn't using vocals or a kick. I assumed that I needed compression, seeing as it's such a ubiquitous studio tool, but when I put it on my tracks, I found it just made them louder. I couldn't work out what I was doing wrong. Finally, after years of not getting it, I read two books that completely changed the way that I understood compression. Mastering the Art and the Science by Bob Katz and Mixing with Your Mind by Michael Paul Stavro. I'd always assumed that compression was to get some parts of a mix to be more prominent than others. But what I finally realized was that actually it was the reverse. It was about trying to get things to sit better in a mix. We don't use compression to make something stick out more. We want to make it so that it's buried in the mix less. This all goes back to the fundamental tenet of mixing, which is that we want to blend things together. We don't want them competing for your attention. This made me realize that compression is actually something that we should use sparingly and made me think a lot more carefully about when and where I might actually use it in my mixes. And lo and behold, my mixes got a lot better. So are you ready to dive into how I approach compression in Ambient? Before you do, you might want to check the description for this video, which contains a link to a cheat sheet, which includes all the information I'm just about to talk about. And you'll also find links to my other free resources around mixing, mastering, and releasing Ambient and experimental music, as well as a link to request a one track master sample from me. All right, let's get into it. So first, what is compression and when do we use it? As with any mixing or mastering tools, it's important to have a goal in mind when you're using a tool. We shouldn't just throw it on thinking it's gonna make something sound better or because we think we need to. So let's quickly review what compression actually does. Compression reduces the volume of the loudest parts of a signal so that the difference between those loud parts and the quiet parts become closer together. What this means in practice is that compared to the original signal, the spikes will get smaller so they won't sound as loud and the quieter parts will sound louder. Now the kind of situations where this will be helpful is if you have one or more tracks in your song where it can be heard over the other tracks sometimes but other times it feels too quiet because of the difference in volume across that track. The most common kinds of recording that gets compressed in rock or pop is vocals, where the performer likely won't be singing at exactly the same volume all the time. They'll move back and forth from the microphone or sing some parts with more power. So this means that if we set that recording at a constant level without any automation, it'll pop out and be louder than other parts of the mix sometimes and be quieter at other times. The compressor is there to even out those volume differences to make it more consistent and that means the other instruments are no longer fighting with it. In ambient music, some examples of tracks that might need compression are field recordings, which often have multiple kinds of sounds at different volume levels, some much louder than others, and arpeggiating synthesizers, which are often very spiky and feel like they're jumping out of a mix if they're really dynamic. Okay, so how do we know if we need compression? The easiest way to do this is at the beginning of your mix session. Once you set all the relative volume levels for all of your tracks, before you do any volume automation, listen through the whole song critically. I find that it's easiest to tell if a track needs compression if, when you turn it up, it fills at the right volume, but when there's a big spike, it feels too loud. Or when you turn it down, the spikes feel they're at the right volume, but the rest of the track feels like it's disappeared. If you don't find any tracks that feel like that, then congratulations, you probably don't need compression in that song. It's also important to note that you might have a track that's very dynamic where it is popping out quite a lot, but you might like that effect. And if that's the case, you don't need to use compression on it. Depending on how much it pops out, you might need to revisit it at the mastering stage. But it's important to note that the compressor is there to serve your creative vision, not to try and squash your track into some kind of particular shape. Because compression reduces dynamic range, it also usually makes a track sound a bit more dull. So they should really only be used if something feels like it's sticking out too much or if it's not feeling particularly even. Let's look at a common example from ambient music for context. So here I have one of my ambient tracks uh, where I've got just a few simple things. I've got a field recording here in blue and the other three are um, various um, synth based uh, drones that I've got coming on. Now let's have a quick listen. So this is the main pad here and you can see that it's pretty static, like there's no huge spikes here. These ones I'm bringing in and out, they're kind of controlled and I want them to kind of do what they're doing.
But this field recording here is where I think we may need some compression. So if we listen to it by itself, we can hear there's a lot of people talking, a lot of footsteps, a kind of background noise. Uh, but then we have this kind of screaming child that's poking up above the mix. So when we listen to it together, We can hear the kid pretty easily, but we can't necessarily hear everything else. Uh, so if I try and turn this up to get all the rest of the sounds in. Now you can hear those footsteps. But that kid's way too loud now. So this is what we want to do with compression. We want to bring down that kid. We want to bring up the kind of steps and those other lovely sounds. Uh, so that we can get them to kind of poke out a little bit more in the mix. Okay, so how do we go about compressing something? Depending on your door, you'll probably have access to a very wide range of compression options. I'm gonna go with the most basic one here, just to avoid confusion. Compressors have four basic controls. Attack, release, threshold, and ratio. Attack controls how quickly the compressor kicks in, so how fast it will start reducing the peaks of the track. Release controls how fast or slow it stops reducing the volume. Threshold controls when the compressor starts working. So the lower the threshold, the more often it'll kick in. And ratio controls how strong the compression effect is. The numbers represent how many decibels of compression happen per decibel over the threshold. So a ratio of two to one means that for every two decibels that we go over the threshold, it will reduce the volume by one decibel. So if we're at 10 decibels over the threshold, it will reduce that volume by five decibels. The best way to hear how each of these works is to turn them to their extremes one at a time. Note that while presets are a good starting point, it's not a great idea to just slap one on and call it a day. It's most important to actually listen to what it's doing to the signal. There's no real right or wrong in terms of the combinations that you use for these settings, as long as they serve the song. You just need to experiment with these settings and use your ears to judge whether it's doing what you need it to do. Just remember what the function of each is as you're working. Here's a good example of some starting settings that you can use. Lastly, you'll probably need to make use of the makeup gain to ensure that the volume of the compressed signal ends up the same as the original signal. As I've mentioned in earlier videos, it's important to keep the post effect volume the same as the pre effect volume so that you can clearly hear the difference. So the makeup gain knob is there to help you match those volumes. To adjust, just use the plugin bypass to flick back and forth between pre and post effect, turning up or down the makeup gain until the volume sounds the same. Once that's done, you'll be able to clearly hear the difference that the compressor has made and decide if it's done what you wanted it to. And most importantly, make sure to apply compression with the whole mix active. Soloing tends to make it easy to go way too far. We're looking to balance the track against the others. So it's important that you tweak it in the context of the mix. Of course, it's fine to solo it while you're matching the input and the output volumes, but make sure you're always returning to the mix to listen to the results. So how do we know if we've done enough compression? This will depend entirely on the mix, which is why it's so important to use your ears. Good compression shouldn't sound obvious. Everything should sit nicely together. I find it's easier to just go a little bit too far to, until it's very obvious and then dial things back by about say 10 to 20%. Then I'll take a short break. So when I come back, 
my ears won't be focused on that one track on anymore and I can listen to the whole mix holistically. And at that point, it'll usually reveal whether I've done the right amount. So let's go back to our example. All right, so now we know that the best way to get this track to sit nicely is to compress that field recording down a little bit, get rid of those peaks and bring up the things that are kind of hiding in the bottom. So the first thing I'm gonna do is throw a compressor on that track and set it to this one. Everything's at their starting positions. I'm gonna choose peak for this. I've messed around a little bit. Peak will make sure that it triggers the compressor when it hits the top of the peak. Whereas the one here, RMS, means that it will choose the average of the volume. So it will be a lot harder to trigger it. Because I'm triggering something that's got a very sharp peak, I'm gonna use that peak option so that it grabs it and clamps down a lot quicker. And I'm gonna apologize in advance, you're gonna hear a lot of screaming children. First, I'm gonna bring down the threshold. Until it starts doing something. Let's just quickly solo it to see what it sounds like now. Okay, so it needs to get more aggressive. It's not making much of a difference yet. Let's start messing with the settings. I'm gonna start by going with the attack first. I'm gonna turn this down to see what happens. Getting better. Turn up the ratio a bit. Okay, it's making a significant difference now. Pretty happy with that. Let's just listen to the difference here. Maybe pull back the attack a little bit. Might even turn it down a little bit more so I can get, try and get a bit more of that. just a trick of working out where you've gone too far. Pull that release back a little bit and then it stops sounding like it's pumping. And maybe pulling it up this a little bit. Alright, so things are starting to pop out. That kid screaming's coming down a bit more. Everything's sitting a little bit better. Down a little bit more. All right, so I think we're in a pretty good spot. I mean, I could sit here and tweak all day if I like, but just for demonstration purposes, I think we're in a pretty good spot. Let's just check one more time. This is the original. So we hear that kid pretty loud and then everything else kind of disappears. But you can hear that kind of background noise, all the people talking and all that stuff has started to come up. The kid's not as loud anymore. Everything's starting to sit pretty nicely. And then once I've got that settled, I can actually probably turn this up a little bit if I wanted to. You know, I could keep tweaking to get that peak to come down a little bit further, um, just to like really set it in the mix to make, make it absolutely perfect. But I think we've got the basics down. I think that that's about all we need. Advanced technique section, serial compression. Serial compression is when you run one compressor into another one. 
This is good for if you have a super dynamic track. You might find that having to aggressively bring down those peaks gives you that dreaded pumping sound. You can combat this by adding another compressor before it. This first compressor should have much gentler settings. We just wanna bring the quietest and the loudest parts together a little bit more, but without getting to that pumping stage. Then the original, more aggressive compressor won't have to work as hard to bring down those big peaks anymore. So you can dial back the settings a little bit. Sidechain compression. This is a fun way to add some more movement to a mix. Use another track as the sidechain input, and when the sidechain track swells up, the compressed track will be pulled down. This allows that swell to briefly dominate the mix, which will add some more movement overall. Parallel compression. In this technique, we copy a track or we bus it and then add super aggressive compression. And then we add that compressed signal back into the mix little by little. This can add a bit more of an aggressive feel because everything will be really squished together. All right, that's it. That's all the basics you need to know about compression. Now go out and try it yourself. And for those that stuck around to the end, congratulations and thank you. Why don't you go ahead and start your comments with the word win to let me know what a winner you are. If you found this valuable, please do click all the buttons below. Please also don't forget to grab that cheat sheet in the description. And if you're thirsty for more, I recommend checking out this video, which goes over another foundational engineering concept that'll help you to 10X your mixes. And until next time, keep making music. Cheers.